Over to you, Charlie. Thank you. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Yane Kandev. Uh, Yane, please tell us about your living histories. I believe you are on mute right now. Okay, sorry about that. It's been a while since I've used Zoom. Um, well, first of all, thank you uh, uh, for organizing this. I, I've had a lot of fun uh, listening to other histories and I, I've learned all sorts of uh, fun and uh, surprising things about many of my colleagues and I've learned a lot of surprising things about people I've known for many years. So that's been quite revealing. So uh, um, the way I thought I'd structure this is uh, I like random walks and I, was, I think a lot about random walks. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about sort of the way things have progressed for me, both in my science and in life. And it's largely been a, a random walk. And uh, it's it's also a bit of a sort of story about friendship and uh, and chance and uh, curiosity. So uh, so I thought I'd, uh, I'd share that with you. So um, I come from Belgrade, which is uh, was the capital of uh, former Yugoslavia a country that no longer exists, uh, that I very much enjoyed uh, growing up in. I, I would spend a lot of time sitting in these cafes uh, in the main square out here uh, at uh, Hotel Moskva. Um, probably the place that had a lot of sort of, uh, or probably had the strongest impact on me in terms of deciding I wanted to do science uh, was this place on the right, that's my high school. We had. I went to one of these sky, high schools that uh, really specialized in uh, physics and mathematics. So I remember in eleventh uh, grade we had something like uh, seven or eight different math classes uh, simultaneously, and I thought that was basically a paradise on earth. So I really, really enjoyed that. Um, contrary to what my friends thought, one should do once once uh, one finishes uh, this mathematical high school. I went to study physics. It was not a very popular thing at the time. Everyone else uh, went, on, went ahead and, be, and uh, took uh, a degree in electrical engineering or mechanical engineering, things of that sort. Because presumably, if you, um, if you got an engineering degree, you were guaranteed a job. And if you got a physics degree, you were guaranteed to be unemployed. So uh, I kind of didn't pay attention to that and just uh, went and did physics. And uh, Spent four years at the university in Belgrade um, and got really excited about statistical mechanics. Uh, there was a professor there who, uh, who had just come from MIT and uh, he um, um, was um, really kind of into things like the renormalization group, which was sort of still a fairly new idea. And he got me working on some problem on, on the renormalization group and phase transitions and things like that. And by the time I was finishing my fourth year, I decided I should really go abroad. Um, everyone again told me I was nuts because uh, uh, the university had offered me, I guess, a permanent position. And, and that's what you were supposed to do is uh, finish your undergraduate and then take on a position at the university and get your doctorate and stay there, uh, become a teacher and all that good stuff. But I just wanted to have an adventure. So I want... I went uh, to Ithaca, New York. Uh, to go, I went to Cornell. Um, funny story there. The reason I went to Cornell is because I found this uh, book in the American Library in Belgrade. That was, it, I guess, it was with the consulate, and uh, it had it was one of these uh, books of universities, and it listed all the professors. And I really wanted to go and study with Michael Fisher and Ken Wilson. Those was, those guys were kind of my heroes at the time. And so I found that there were professors at Cornell. So I applied, I, I got in, I was very excited. I went to Cornell. First thing I find out is that uh, Michael Fisher and Ken Wilson had left, I think 10 years prior. And that never occurred to me. Well, turns out the book I was looking at in the consulate was 20 years old or something. But uh, where I grew up, uh, you did not do that. If you're a professor at university, that's basically what you did for your whole life. So, so that was a bit of a shock, but it was okay. I, adjusted. Uh, I spent a lot of my time at Cornell <clears throat> windsurfing and skiing. That's how I stayed sane. Uh, other, other, when I wasn't windsurfing and skiing, I was in this building, uh, Clark Hall, where I did condensed matter theory. I got very lucky, again, by total chance. I, I really wanted to work 
with this young professor that showed up at Cornell doing string theory. I was very excited about string theory for no other reason uh, other than it just the math looked kind of cool. And um, and uh, this was Brian Greene. He later became quite famous for a lot of different things. But Brian had a one position and there was a bunch of us who wanted to work with him and I, I wasn't his uh, choice. So so I kind of begrudgingly went and talked to this guy, Chris Henley, who turned out to be probably the best uh, thing that could have happened to me in terms of my science uh, in, in many different ways. And probably one of the most important ways was that he taught me about the importance of having intuition and not just uh, being a slave to the mathematics. So uh, with Chris, I worked on sort of uh, very esoteric things. I'll tell you a little bit about later. But um, again, uh, once I was finishing up at Cornell, most of the people I was in class with got super excited about um, using their knowledge of statistical physics to make bets on the market. So uh, those were the original quants. This was 1995. So most of my graduating class went to various uh, financial institutions and uh, did all sorts of things, made a lot of money, broke the stock market, et cetera. I wasn't that adventurous or I just wasn't that interested, I guess both, both were true. So I, I just went to do a postdoc and that landed me in, in Providence. The reason I ended up there at Brown was because I met someone at Cornell who uh, moved, just had recently moved to Brown, uh, Brad Marston. And he said, why don't you come to Brown? And that seemed like a good idea. So I went there. After a couple of years working on things like the Quantum Hall there, um, I had met another guy, Tom Spencer, who was at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. So he said, why don't you come to Princeton and do some mathematics? So I thought, why not? So this was all completely sort of random, unplanned. Uh, there was no concept there other than, well, this sounds fun. So I'll just uh, I'll just do that. And uh and the kinds of things I was working on were also all over the place. So I was working on these weird random walks just because they seemed like really interesting to me as geometrical problems had nothing to do with anything uh, real. I also worked on some problems on turbulence, which mostly failed, I would say. I don't think we really made any progress. And then we ha I had some kind of wacky ideas about the quantum Hall effect, which more or less all failed as well, but I had a lot of fun a lot of fun doing that. Uh, so this was all happening uh, in the late 90s. And I was uh, teaching and um, and doing research. I was teaching at the university at Princeton and doing research at the Institute. But I got really tired. I was also living in New York City. And that turned out to be a terrible, terrible idea. So I was looking to leave uh, the New York area. And I got very lucky. And uh, I moved to Brandeis. And actually, these three topics in 1999. And these three things were the things I proposed, I remember, on my first grant, which I was very lucky to get. And like I said, all three things that I proposed in that grant were uh, more or less failures. Some other things that I didn't put in the grant turned out to work out. And somehow the <laughs> the granting agency, NSF, seems to not have mine too much and, and it continues to support me to this day. So they're very, they seem to be very tolerant of all my failures. Um, and sort of all through this time, uh, I was close friends with this guy, Rob Phyllis. Some of you might have known we met while we were at Cornell. We were in the same group uh, with Chris Henley. And around 2000, when I just moved to Brandeis, uh, he, he was uh, he's a little older. So he had uh, finished uh, Brown, got his tenure and was moving to Caltech. And then we then we kind of were talking and we had been skiing a lot and doing all sorts of fun things. But we never did science together. So then. Rob got interested in writing a book on models and physics. And so we were going to try to write this book, which originally was planned to have like a few thousand pages because we were going to examine every single simple model that exists in physics. And uh, and so for about a year, we were doing that. And then uh, we were discussing things like uh, the Schwarzschild radius and Beta's model of the sun. And this was all going to be in this book. But then at some point, we decided, well, the thing we're really interested in is in living things how we got there that's a whole different story neither of us had anything to do with biology up until then uh in fact i could say i i spent most of my life avoiding biology and chemistry i thought they were like the worst sciences on the planet when i was back in yugoslavia i more or less equated biology with marxism because they were taught at the same level and somehow after that whole history i ended up thinking maybe i should work on biology 
So, uh, so we got on in 2001 on this kind of crazy adventure that's been going on since then uh, for the last uh, 20 odd years where we've been kind of thinking about uh, problems in biology, but mostly guided by uh, this book that now we're trying to write the third edition of. So it's been a lightning rod for almost uh, everything that I can say I've done in, in my science for the last 20 years. And, uh, um, and so, um, you know, so, so looking back on sort of this, this journey that, that, that resulted in this book, I, I feel like it's been uh, informed by or the kinds of themes that, that came out uh, that still continue to sort of uh, guide my thinking in, in science and in particular in my thinking about uh, living systems is uh, these four themes that one, and they're kind of, you know, simple things that, that are maybe obvious to physicists, but one was just, if you start thinking about one thing, then it turns out one thing like DNA can have many different representations and these different representations require you to think about different mathematics and different uh, phenomenology. So that seems like a useful uh, thing to carry around. Another one is uh, that's really fun. There's this constant tension when you're doing math and biology between universality, things that are kind of generally true or simple, like the harmonic oscillator and all the different uh, peculiarities about biological systems. Um, one thing that's really fun to think about is that uh, many things that are very distant from the point of view of biology, like maybe development and chemotaxis and uh, uh, can be very close when you think of them in terms of physics, both connected by diffusion. And finally, the thing that, that I really enjoy to this day doing is picking up cartoons in papers or in books on biology and then try to turn those cartoons into mathematics. And we've discovered often that that simple process of turning a cartoon into mathematics can lead to to different to kind of fun insights. So I wanted to share those those four themes with everyone. And then, you know, thinking back, like uh, the, the things that really mattered, that mattered most and that continue to matter most in doing science is uh, has always been to work with people I enjoy working with. So I've I've done all sorts of strange, you could say, or weird things that made no sense in retrospect in science, simply because there was someone there who I really enjoy working with, working with who said, hey, you want to work on this? And I'd be like, sure, I'll work on anything with, with you know, that, that particular person. I've been extremely lucky to have students who just uh, either uh, like me because they are clueless often or because they're fearless. Uh, those two tend to be uh, interchangeable. They will just work on anything uh, that gets thrown at them. And so that's been that's been a fantastic source of inspiration. And finally, um, I believe I very strongly believe in the power of teaching uh, as a way of learning uh, your science. And not only, of course, does it allow you to meet all sorts of wonderful interesting people um, all over the world, but also I know uh, for me, it's been an amazing opportunity to really learn a lot of things that uh, presumably I should have learned in school, but I, I never, I never did. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you for a wonderful talk and I'm applauding on behalf of the audience. Uh, so I'll start out with a, a question from the audience. Uh, You've highlighted so wonderfully the sense of humor with which you approached life in various contexts. So the question is, uh, did this sense of humor also inform or influence your choice of topics to work on in any interesting way? That's, that's a, yeah, I don't know about humor, uh, but, um... I, you know, I mean, it's interesting, like, you know, you talk to some people and they have some, they have fairly sort of grand ideas or big ideas about finding general principles and, 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 and discovering sort of some hidden and under or underlying, um, you know, causes to things. I never, uh, you know, so for me, science has never been about that. It's been about people first and foremost. But then also just puzzles, you know, someone comes and tells me something that sounds strange. Uh, usually I'll, I'll jump into that. And, uh, and, and especially if it involves Legos, I really like playing with Legos. So I've got, I've got Legos everywhere. I like putting them together. I like coming up with mathematical problems that involve Legos. So uh, yeah, so 
I guess Legos are a big uh, a big uh, factor, but I don't know about humor. <laughs> yeah. Great, thank you, thank you. Um, and thank you again for a wonderful talk. Um, sure.